John chapter number two. I'm going to read the last two verses, and it says this. We've been teaching classes in session. I want to read to you. Our shirts will be in a couple weeks. I want you to say it with me. One, two, three. Number one, say, follow God. Say it like you ate something. Say it like you were on time. Number one, say, follow God. Number two, love people. Number three, change the city. I was out yesterday in Claremont, uh, and a lady asked, stop me. This is love people. The lady stopped me and said, would you like to rent me? And at first, I said, well, I don't understand what you're saying. She said, would you like to rent me? I said, no, I'm, I'm good. I appreciate it, though. Uh, amen. Praise God. So I walked off, went in the store, and uh, went, we, when I went, I went to go meet Rob and Elisha, and Jean at uh, this restaurant in Claremont and then I saw her again and I said either you following me or God is talking to you and she said "Uh, you want some Henny I said I don't drink she said well I got some bottles in the car you can spray I got some Hugo balls and some I said well I'm good I said well she said well you lying to me I know you drink I said well I don't drink unless it's communion but I am a pastor. And she's like, oh, you a pastor? I said, yeah. So I said, obviously God allowed us to meet again. And there must be a purpose to this meeting beyond just this conversation. And I, I said, hey, I have two guys that go to the church. I called Rob and I said, hey, Rob, come outside and testify about our church. Uh, Rob never showed up. I don't know what happened. I was, I was telling her I could have been getting killed out there and I just been telling Rob, come outside, and he wasn't even there. And so Gene, he weren't coming because he was eating, so there was just, you could be getting beat up. If Gene eating, forget about it. So I said, um, I think it's important that you understand the value of God for your life. And it, she said, well, I love God. Uh, what's wrong with you? No, I said, I said, you know, we're not asking about do you not love God. We're, we're talking about being in desperate situations and forcing you to do desperate things. And we had a really good conversation. And then at the end, my prophetic gift started kicking in. And she said, okay, we're not finna do this out here. We're not finna do this out here. I'm about to gamble and you up here making me convicted. I gotta go, bye, bye, bye. So she took our church information and hope she comes. Anyway, Jonah chapter number th- two, verse 10, it says, what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah on dry land. And verse number, chapter number three, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It had about 100,000 people in their context. And that was big back then. That was huge. It took three days to go through it. Kind of like a Texas. It take a long time to go from one side to the other. And Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believe God. And then because they believe God, they called a fast. They called a fast. Called a fast. Here, here's a question. We don't talk to our neighbor here at the church and touch our neighbor because there's a lot of germs in that. But I just want you to look at your neighbor and say this. When's the last time you fasted? All right, just asking you. It's a, it's a spiritual, it's just a spiritual question. It's just a question. Um, when's the last time you fasted? And when Jonah's want to read. See, see when, God, when you can't get clarity on God's word, sometimes you got to call a fast. And sometimes when God gives you a word that's so hard to receive, you got to go on a fast. So when you can't get clarity, you go on a fast. And when you can't, and when God gives you a word that's sometimes bigger than you, you go on a fast so that God can help you understand and interpret what he said. A fast is abstaining from food food it's liquids only it's not eating chips and and smoothies in the morning and all that no it's a water fast it's a time you separate yourself from everything to go be with God now Jonah is an interesting passage of scripture which I'm going to spend a lot of time next week on talking about because we only celebrate Jonah because of the fish in the whale but that's really not the gist of Jonah Jonah's story is made up in Jonah chapter number four when God 
God gives him a word and he gives the word and God doesn't perform the word and Jonah is mad because God doesn't do what he said he was going to do through Jonah and Jonah's mad because his ego's bruised. And some of you, I realize the only reason why you mad at God is because you feel entitled. You feel like you should have been in the room with the divine counsels of God. And because they did not include you in, you mad at God because he did not include you in the plan. And it's a powerful passage in when we look at this. But here it is. Jonah was a modern Pharisee. And I believe the Pharisees were people who knew the Bible, but they didn't see it right. They knew the word, but didn't see it right. Because when you're a Pharisee, it's hard for you to see fairly. Okay, when you're a Pharisee, you can be a Pharisee and not even know you're a Pharisee. You can be a Pharisee by judging other people because they sin differently than you. It's like the lady that I met yesterday. Yeah, she may sin differently than me, but we all are sinners. We all need to be saved by the same blood. We all need to be saved by the same grace. We all need the same anointing. And I say, I'm not judging you. Who am I to judge you? I don't drink, but I'm not judging you because you drink. I'm just simply saying that we all need God the same dimension to the same degree. So the reality of the matter is this. Jonah was a modern day Pharisee because he loved God using him, but he didn't love the people that God sent him to be used to. So we got to be careful with that, that even in loving people, that we don't start loving them from our judgment zone. Because you cannot be the judge and jury at the same time of people's sins. You've got to allow room for God to do what he's going to do. And so here it is. Here's the interesting thing. God's plan for our lives are for his praise. But God gives us a plan so that we can share in praise. Let me say it one more time. God's plan for our lives are for his praise. But God gives us a plan so that we can share in his praise. You got to understand that it doesn't belong to you, it's his. And he just was kind enough to include you and I in his plan. And sometimes we could get mad at God because we really want it to be our plan. And a lot of days I've got to ask myself, are my plans God's plans? Are they my own plans that I've drafted up and asked God to bless? I've got to know that maybe God is asking me to do what I don't want to do. Go to Nineveh, go to Atlanta, go to Virginia. Lord, I don't want to go. But Lord, if this is your plan for my life I will submit myself to your plan and I will humbly leave what I love behind trusting that you know what is good for me and what is right for me God's plan for our lives is for his praise he doesn't give you a plan, Michelle, for your own praise. He gives you a plan for his praise. It is not about us. God gave us a plan for his good pleasure. God gave us a plan for his good pleasure. So here's a question. Jonah needed to ask this question, but didn't ask it soon enough. Is your plan in partnership with God for what he wants in the season of life you're in? Is your plan in partnership with God? Because there's a lot of things I want to do. But just because I want to do it doesn't mean God is in it. When you live a God-centered life, you start asking the questions on God, if you save me, what did you save me to partner you with? God, what are you asking me to partner with you to do? Not what I, what, remember, not everything God asks you to do, you're going to want to do. If everything God asks you to do, you want to do, you want to check your plan. Because there's a lot of things God asks us to do that you're like, God, can you ask somebody else to do it? God, did you asking me to go on a three-day fast with no food? No, no, I'm asking you. Because when God is asking you to do something, it will not always be what you want done. So here's some things I want to ask you. Number one, God told Jonah to number one go where is God tell someone scream out go you ain't say it loud enough scream out go 
not good enough. Scream out, go. go. One more time. Scream out, go. go. Where is God asking you to go that you refuse to go? Where is God asking me to go? God is always telling us to go somewhere. Where are you asking me to go? Whose house are you asking me to go to that I don't want to go? What job person are you asking me to go to and I don't want to go? Who, what student are you asking me to speak to and I don't want to speak to? What spouse are you asking me to speak a word to? Who are you asking me to pray with that I don't want to do? God is always asking us to go. I was telling somebody yesterday, I was like, man, I used to be a lot harder on sinners. When I mean sinners, I mean going after sinners than where I felt like I was now. And so my thing is, where has God asked me to go? God's asked me to go where people will not go. I want to go where people will not go. That doesn't mean I want to go to the club. That just simply means I want to go where the average person will not go. I want to meet the dope boy. I want to meet the gangbanger. I want to meet the prostitute. I want to go. I want to go where God asked me to go. And I stopped and looked at that young lady and I said to her, I said, you remind me of my sister. I said, I am standing in the gap that someone else will be the same type person I am to you that someone would be to her. And so sometimes God is asking us to go and communicate to people that don't look like us because she didn't look like me. She didn't dress like me, but God told me to go. And it didn't matter who drove by and saw Rev talking to that person. God told me to go. And you and I got to be willing to go to people that really need them and they need someone like you and I who are dressed like them, look like them to go and say, hey, I want to let you know about a God that can change your life like he changed my life. I need to need to go. I need to go. I need someone to scream out, go. I need to go. And you can get so saved for so long. You could be found for so long that you forgot that you were once lost. That we all were lost at one point. And if God didn't find us, we would still be lost. And I've got to remind myself, I could have been sleeping in my grave. Could have been doing what everybody else is doing. But God found me. And I don't want to get to the point where it's just me in my row. I want to go and find every person and tell them, listen, I'm not I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm not telling you to be righteous. I'm telling you to follow somebody that is righteous, that is able, and I don't care what you say. The church may be a hypocrite, but God ain't a hypocrite. He can take care of your soul. Take care of your soul. You gotta go. You gotta go. Number two, you gotta go to Nineveh. I gotta go where I don't like to go. It's not always popular. I gotta go where I don't like to go. Number two, I gotta do. I gotta do. Someone scream out, do. Say it like you ate something. Say do. Say it like you're gonna get your hair done. Say do. Okay, say it like someone owes you money. Do. Okay, okay, so I got I gotta do. I gotta do. I gotta do what God said. I don't need to just go where he told me to go. I got to do what he said because a lot of us are going where he sent us, but we're not doing what he told us to do. You're going there and then you realize, oh, I'm in now. So now you're being like them, acting like them and not doing what God sent you to do when you were there. I didn't ask you to do that. I asked you to do what I told you to do. I didn't ask you to do anything else. I asked you to do what I told you to do. It's just like the preacher we had on Wednesday. He said, man, I could have preached a different message. I said, but that's not what God wanted you to do do even though you could erect it with a different type of word but God gave you this word and I gotta do what God asked me to do I'm not gonna do my own thing I'm gonna do what God said for me to do I'm gonna do it in the way that God called me to do it I'm not gonna transform or conform like the world wants me to I gotta do what he's asked me to do what is God asking you to do Maybe God is telling, hey, go, go over there and pray for that person. Who, me? Yeah, you. Go there and pay their lunch. Who, me? Yeah, you. Maybe God is saying, oh, go ahead, pay their car note. Who, me? Yeah, you. 
Maybe, maybe God is telling you, this after service, go buy a pastor some joy. Maybe God is telling you to do that. that that's, yeah, that's you. So these are these type of things. God may be speaking to you to do something that you don't want to do, but that's what God is asking you to do. Because you, you never know when God asks you to do something in one season, how it may be planting a seed for a harvest in the next season of your life. Do. Go do what God has asked you to do. Jonah, don't just go there and then not do what I asked you to do. Like, like oh, oh next week's going to be so good about how the prophetic person, how when God uses people prophetically, how they go through emotional mood swings. And that's why you got to be careful of dating someone who you say, I want to date someone that hears God. Well, all throughout scripture, everyone who heard God is very moody. I ain't going to hold that long. But here it is. Number three, be. Don't just go and do, but be. Be who I called you to be. Don't be anything different than what I called you to be. I don't care how you got in the room. Don't change who you are because you got there. Be who I made you to be. I called you. I sent you. You need to be who I asked you to be. I need you to don't, don't try to change who you are to try to fit a mold that God never created you to fit. You got to be who God made you to be. And most of us, the only challenge God has is when he sent you, he can't find you. He looking for you and you looking for somebody else. He want you. If he wanted somebody else, he would have sent somebody else. Be who God made you to be because God can't anoint who you pretend to be. The anointing only falls on the authentic self. And you got to be who God has made you to be. Whenever God sends you somewhere, be who God made you to be. Yeah. Find your soul. Somebody say so. Say like some life. Say so. Say like you're getting free jerk chicken after service. Say so. For you vegans, say it like you're getting lettuce after service. Say so. You got to find your soul. S-O. So God so loved the world. Why did he do it? Because he so loved the world. I got to find my soul. And whatever my soul is, that's what I go after. I got to find my soul. The reason why you're not coming alive, you haven't found your soul. What is your niche? What have you been called to? What have you been in? Find your soul. And when you find your soul, come alive in your soul. Do what God called you to do. This is why God called you so this could happen. Find your soul. Find your soul. My, I know my soul. My, my soul is young, unchurched people. That's my soul. Like, put me anywhere. I'm on vacation. I'm looking at people like, yo, I want to talk to them about God. Like, I just want a whole conversation because that's my type of generation. Find your soul. What makes you come alive? Find your soul. And if you don't find your soul, you're going to live your entire life trying to redefine yourself through other people. Some of you need to log off Instagram, Facebook. Twitter, Black Planet, all that. You need to log off all of them and you need to go find your soul because some of you, I don't know who you are. You're just a counterfeit makeup of somebody you're trying to be and that's not your soul. You got to find your own soul. You got to find your own style. You got to find your own swag. You got to find your own drip. You got to find your own soul and until you find your soul, you will never be satisfied. Jonah, I sent you to Nineveh, not Africa, not Atlanta. It's Nineveh. I don't like Nineveh, but that's my soul. I don't want to go where everybody else is going. No shade, Edda. I want to go where God called me to go. I don't want to be following the trend. Maybe God is not in the trend. He's in my soul. And my soul may not be as nice as yours. It may not be as pretty as yours. But this is my soul. And God will prosper me in my soul. When I find what I'm called to do, when I find what I'm anointed to do, God will prosper me in my soul. It may not be what you do it may not be like you do it but this is my soul you gotta find your soul who did God call you to 
God called everybody to somebody. It's not just that God didn't save you to follow God and it be it. God called you to something. He called you to someone. You got to find your soul. So they will repent. You know what's the amazing thing about it? We invite everybody to all types of things except for the house of God. We invite them to clubs. We invite them to parties. We invite them to movies. We invite them to restaurants. We invite them to good hair places. But when's the last time you found a soul and invited them to the house of God? Not to just hear this, but when was your just intentional? When did it ever burden your heart? And as a pastor, I have to ask myself the same question. Is it burdening your heart to see people dying and not go to heaven? Or do you just not care? Are you like Jonah? You want to be used of God like the pipe, but you don't want to get wet. You want God to use you, but you don't want to get wet in the process of being used. And so Sometimes getting someone to find their soul means you got to get dirty with them. You got to get unclean with them. You got to be where they are to reach them. I'm not saying violate your morals. I'm simply saying sometimes in order for me to get you to my soul, I've got to get into your world. And how can I find you if I'm only in light? Sometimes I need to go around darkness so that I can bring darkness to Man, when I was in Louisiana, one thing that tripped me out, I saw every different type of religious group there. I ain't seen no Christians there. I ain't seen no church folk there. I was at least looking for a bishop with a Jared Curl and a cross in his pocket. I ain't seen him there either. I was looking for some apostle. I ain't seen no apostle there either. We so caught up of trying to be in the church while the people that really are struggling, they're not in the church, they're outside the church. And most of the weapons that you want to preach, you want to prophesy, heck, there's a bunch of people, you can go to their house. Listen, I want to come to your house and pray. Ain't nobody in their right mind going to reject a Christian, calling them, saying, listen, I feel like I need to come to your house and pray. Shoot, what time are you coming over? Because everybody wants prayer. And when's the last time it burdened your heart so bad that you picked up your phone and called somebody, went to their house and prayed? Or let's not get that deep when's the last time you picked up your phone and called somebody and prayed with them but you a Christian listen my wife always tells me one squirt is enough a cologne right because you don't smell it when it's on you right you spray it and you're like I don't smell it. So you got to spray it again, right? And then you spray, right? And then you got, Elder John told me I had to spray my wrist because that's where the blood vein goes. And then you spray your neck because that's where all the vein. So anyway, so, 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 but if I spray something on me, if you get around me long enough, you're going to smell what's on me. The problem is, is most people can't smell what's on us because we ain't taking a bath in it yet. And if you take a bath in your faith, people should be able to smell what's on you, even if they don't want to smell it. Some of us don't even have one squirt of Christianity on us. We don't have a half a squirt on us. We don't have a quarter of a squirt on us. They should be able to smell. You yeah. have. You know, I, I kind of do want to go back to the old generation of um, where they had so much cologne, they, you couldn't smell anything else but God. They had like brute back in the day. If you still wear brute, <laughs> let's talk after service. We really need to. Like they, they just had that strong cologne. They just were so strong about their faith. And I asked ourselves this, this question to myself, and I asked it of you. Has your life ever caused someone not to want to follow Christ anymore? Like, it's, it's, it's a real question. So here, here's the thing. So now, after I told you all these, go, do, but here's the thing that's important that you and I must get. God's call, this is something you may want to write. God's call is an invitation to purpose. Whatever God calls you to do, it's an invitation to purpose. It's an invitation to purpose. It's an invitation of purpose. So when God calls you, it's an invitation to purpose. If you accept the call of God, it leads to pregnancy. 
you accept God's call to purpose and leads to pregnancy, you start getting, you start thinking about those people in Nineveh. Man, I just keep thinking about them Ninevites. Oh, man, them Ninevites, man. Ooh, man. You just start thinking about yourself because you're pregnant about it. Have you ever wanted to quit, but you know you're called to it? And you're like, man, I quit. You're talking about, you know, I know I quit, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm going to do it one more month. One more month. I'm going to tolerate with y'all one more month. Right? Because you, you called to it. Because it's an invitation of purpose. But leads to pregnancy. Leads to God imparting something in you. Because God will impregnate you with something because he wants you to fall in love with something you haven't seen so that when you see it, you're attached to it. See, that's why God gives us visions, because visions are what God gives us as manifestations of what we saw inside of us. And God hopes you fall so much in love with the picture that you can overcome, number three, the pain. There, there's, no pro yeah, there's no process without pain. There's no, there's no pregnancy without pain. I don't care how good it looks on the surface. I don't care how awesome it seems on the outside. There's always a level of pain to any invitation of purpose. Get over it. Stop thinking, oh man, I saw his car. He living a life. Every person is going through some level of pain to their purpose. I don't care how they dress it up. I don't care if they got red bottoms on. I don't care if they got Oakley pair of glasses on. I don't care if they're wearing St. John. I don't care if they're wearing Louis Vuitton. I don't care if they're wearing Christian Vuitton. They all have pain in their purpose. There's no exemptions. There's pain in marriage. There's pain in anything that's, go anything that's worth having, there's going to be a level of pain. In it. Even in your marriage, there's going to be pain in it. You got this beautiful picture, we're going to travel the seas, we're going to make love every single day, every single hour, every single second, every single minute, every single, you know. Then you have kids, then they sleep between you and steal your food and you have financial challenges and then, so the picture is supposed to keep you, so the wedding day is supposed to keep you reminded of what it could be like. But we got to work to get there. And this generation, work is a curse. You want everybody's stuff, but you don't want to work for it. You want everybody's blessing, but you don't want to work for it. You don't want to suffer for it. You want everybody's thing. You want this type of system where I want you to give. No, no, no. You got to do some work, baby. Because if it costs me something, it got to cost you something. But here it is. It leads to pregnancy, it leads to pain. But, but every level of pain, when you start going through pain, God starts teaching you about process. Process is important. Process is important, Jonah, because I want to teach you how to process your pain, how to deal with your pain. Jonah, you don't, you don't like the people. Come back to me when you don't like them. Don't let them feel the wrath of your disappointment in them because a lot of you are so disappointed in everybody that you're pouring into that you start whipping them because they're not reaching their capacity. And now instead of you being a mentor to them, you're a tormentor to them. You remind them of their failings and their shortcomings. And when they don't meet the goal, God is saying, come to me. I'm going to give you a process on how to deal with pain. Because if you don't know how to deal with pain, you will contaminate good things. Now, you got to learn how to process your pain. Not everything that goes wrong in your life is God's fault. That means you don't know how to process your pain. That's where Jonah was. Oh, God, you messed me up. No, 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 baby. You messed yourself up. God isn't responsible for our own decisions that we make. It is easy to blame it on God because he's all-knowing. He's all-sufficient. But at one point in my life, i got to say, God, it may not be you. It may just be me. i got to learn how to process my stress. Because if you don't learn how to process pain, you're not going to make it long. If you got to drink every time life goes the way that you don't want, you in trouble. But Jonah, every time it didn't go the way that Jonah wanted, you know what he did? He ran. And that's what some of you are, professional runners. You run to mama's house. You run to your homegirls. You run to your homeboys. You tell them everything when they don't go the way you want. You got to learn how to process your pain and not run when things don't go the way you want. Some of you, this is your 35th 
church. It is not the church that's the problem. It is the fact that you are a runner. Some of you on your 35th relationship, it is not the relationships, it is you. You gotta learn how to process your pain. Everybody will deal with pain. You've gotta find a process that is healthy, that will allow you to deal with pain and still function. You got to learn how to function in pain because if you don't know how to function in pain, you'll never go to the promised land. You'll never do what God told you to do. You'll never go where God told you to go. You'll never do what God told you to do. You'll never be what God told you to be. You've got to learn how to function in pain. A process. A process. You got to learn the process. Man, everybody shouldn't feel your wrath because life isn't going good. That's not a process, Jonah. You can't run from everybody because life ain't going good. I just need to be by myself. I don't need to be by myself. I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. No, 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 no. Don't throw a tantrum like a little baby because you don't know how to deal with pain. You got to learn how to cooperate. You got to learn how to communicate. You got to learn how to say what's on your mind. Ain't nobody got time to read you. Ain't nobody got time to understand and diagnose you. Oh, okay. It's this time of the month. Every year around this time of the calendar. We ain't got that type of time. You got to learn how to process your pain. Even when it hurts you you need to articulate you need to say something you need to say it hurts right here don't wait for anybody to figure it out say something learn how to process your pain learn how to process your pain because if you don't learn how to process your pain so here it is the difference between medicine and poison is the dosage. And what used to medicate you is now poisoning you. You're taking too much of an unhealthy dose of it. So you go from one day, you know, I'm mad at you, I ain't talking to you for a whole day. That's how I'm gonna process it. And then it becomes three months. Cause one, dose of something too much becomes poison. Number four or five, six or seven, whatever it is. Number five is production. When God starts doing it, when God starts doing it in your life, the production, you start seeing the production happening. Here's the greatest enemy you'll have, yourself. Jonah's enemy wasn't anybody else, it was himself. He started getting mad at God for some weird reason in Jonah 4, he's, he's so mad, he's just angry. He's so angry that he can't enjoy the production of the season he's in. And the craziest thing is some of you making a lot of money and you're still miserable. You making more money than you ever made in college and you still unhappy. You making more money and you're doing more things than you've ever done and you're still unhappy. Because here's the thing. Getting into the promised land is not a promise if you lose the God who promised you it. So, 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 so here, let me help some of you, some of you entrepreneurs, and here's what's happening. You growing, God blowing you up. You, you on the cusp, you about, you about to, you about to come up. And you know what's crazy about all y'all that keep coming up? You leave the people behind who started with you. You mean tell me, you know, y'all done struggle together? You used to catch the bus together. You got married, now y'all finally made it, got a house, got a car, got a little money in the bank, and now y'all gonna walk away from each other and let somebody else enjoy what you worked hard to build? 
Oh, the devil is lying. Oh, absolutely not. There ain't no way in the world that you done did all of this together. You done work. You done got to 15 years. You done built this beautiful life. You got these beautiful kids, and you gonna let the devil come in and take 15 years from your life? Oh, you out your mind. You must be temporarily insane. I know you got some arguments. I know his breath stinks sometimes, but that's the reality of life. There's gonna be painful seasons, but you can't run in the season. I got too much invested in this. I got too much invested to walk away. Some of you spend all of your days working and doing what God called you to do, and you let some devil run you out. Ain't no way in the world. I got too much invested. I'm going to reap my harvest. I'm going to reap my benefits. I ain't leaving until I get all that I'm supposed to get. Ain't no way in the world. Ain't no way in the world. Ain't no way in the world. I done been with God too long. I done went through too much hell. Then to walk away and start all over. I don't even know how to dance again. I don't even know how to drink again. I ain't going back that way. I got too much invested to walk away from what I've invested in. No. No. I'm gonna keep showing up to work every day. You want me to quit? I'm gonna keep showing up every day. Every day. Cause I got I've been here 15 years and I'm not gonna let you rolling your eyes at me, talking about me, make me walk out of a job that God gave me. God put me here, and when God wants to remove me, he will remove me. But till that time, you're gonna get all of this trip, every bit of it. Cause God put me. Lastly, profit, profit, because anything that you do long enough, you start reaping from, you start reaping from, and if you come from a poor background, one of the greatest challenges is to learn how to enjoy the fruits of your labor. It is a very hard thing to enjoy the fruits of your life because you're like, no, nah, I don't want to do that because, no, nah, I can't do that. You got to learn how to, in some of you feel guilty for what God has given you. Some of you feel guilty. It's a hard thing. It's a weird psychological thing where you feel bad that God has actually promoted. You almost hide your stuff because you don't want people to know that God is right. Listen, listen, you got to learn something. If God gave it to you, it's yours. You, you gotta, I gotta close, I'm done. You, you get, so, I was talking to this old man in Miami. He's a rich guy. I met him in Miami. I went down to Miami to meet him, just to spend some time and just pick his brain. And I said, what would be one thing that you wish you could do differently if you could? He said, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. If I could, he's a weirdo. He said, if I asked him to take a picture, he's like, I don't do pictures. I'm like, oh, okay, great, jerk. Um, but here, here's the, but he gave me advice. So here's what he said. He said, I would not be afraid to enjoy the fruits of my labor. He said, it took me years to finally realize if I labored for it, I should at least eat from it. profit if you've been doing anything that God has called you to be it's got a profit that doesn't mean make material monies and all that it just means it's got to be it's got to be purposeful 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 so here's the thing if God gives you something you got to steward it because just because God gave it to you in one season doesn't mean he's obligated to keep it in your same season on the next. Sorry, I'm just going to let y'all mander on that. Where's God calling you to go? What is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to be? And what is yourself? Right? God's called me to go. Where's God called me to go? Like whether it's in business, like, hey, there's some people doing things in business that I'm like, man, I can admire what you're doing, but I don't want what you have. Because some of you chasing a whole bunch of stuff because you don't know your, you don't know your soul. Like I know my soul. Like, yeah, that may work for you, but I'm not called to do that. And I'm okay with that. Okay. So you got to know your soul. You got to know your soul. Like, you know, there's certain things that we're just not, we're not interested in doing. My wife and I are not interested in doing. And we're okay with that. Other people may do it and they're winning doing it, but we cool not doing it. 
You got to be okay with walking away from what everybody else is doing because you're not called to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, okay, yeah, y'all are doing that. That's nice. I don't want to do that. Because I know my goal. I know what, where my goal is. I got, you got to know what your goal is. What is your goal? Like, not everything is for me. I don't, I don't want to go. Okay, we're recording. Okay, praise God. Like, I, I don't, there's some, I don't, I don't want to go there. Like, I don't care who's going there. Okay, how many people are going to be there? I'm not going. And I'm okay with you telling everybody I didn't go. Because that's not my soul. Because a lot of times, so for me, I have to learn how to funnel my, what gets in my head because I don't want anything getting in my head staying there too long that doesn't pay me rent. I gotta find my soul, so I gotta control what gets into my head space because whatever gets in my head space gets in my heart space. Ooh, let me close with this, this is good, this, this is good. Sometimes when you deal with drama, pre, uh, drama people, the best thing to do to love them is to say, I love you so much that the best way I can love you is from afar. Because if I bring you close, I won't love you properly. The, be the best way I can love you is loving you afar. Because I've learned that if I bring you close, I stop loving you. So not to hurt you and hurt me, the best way I'm going to love you is I'm going to love you from afar. That's called process. You got to learn how to process people in the right way. Right? Okay, you're a leech. That's cool. I've learned how I have a process for leeches. To make you feel like you're sucking something and realize that you've been sucking a long time and when you look at the end of it, you really got nothing because you thought you were getting something. I have a process. It making sense? I have a process. So, so you're going to buy a house. What's your process? You're going to start the business. What's the process? Bow your heads. I don't want to run over. Father, I thank you for what you said, what's being said, what's being done in this place. It's beyond our control and comprehension.